started. Um, welcome to those of you if this is your first Readouts webinar. I have seen some of the sign ups, so I think some of you have been here before, you've seen our webinars before um, and you know the firm, but for those of you um, who are new to the webinar and perhaps haven't come across Readouts before, we're a specialist law firm that acts for health and social care providers exclusively. We don't act for anyone else. Um, we don't act for commissioners and we don't act for um, individual service users and families. So I've just seen there's some questions popping up at the bottom about the slides. Yes, we will circulate the slides at the end. Um, we will also circulate the video of, of the webinar. I see someone else has also popped up asking about a colleague being approved. I think all of our outstanding approvals were, were done this morning. Um, so everyone should have login details, but if anyone has missed it, um, I'm not sure if we can if we can admit anyone else now, but certainly the video will be available afterwards, which you can share. So yeah, um, that that's readouts basically. And this morning we decided to do um, this webinar, sort of in response to a decision which is very very important for the sector. Um, if it had gone a different way, I think perhaps the webinar would have been a lot busier this morning and um, it would have been quite wide implications for the sector, but there are still some outstanding issues arising out of this decision. We've already had a number of questions from pr providers about the practical impact of it. So we thought that in addition to our usual webinar programme, we would run uh, a special short webinar this morning, which um, will take you through some of the key decisions that you might need to make as a result of the MENCAP decision coming out of the Supreme Court. Can I have the next slide, please? And the next slide. That slide just introduces me. Um, I'm Laura, I'm a senior associate at, at, at Redouts. I'm joined by Paul, who's our managing director, and he's gonna take you through some of the practical consequences of the decision. I'm going to give you a bit of the background, but what I'm not proposing to do is take you through chapter and verse, the facts, the decision, the cases have been around for a long time, and I suspect what you are interested in as providers is what is the actual impact for you, what are the answers to the questions you have about the, about the decision and the impact that it is going to have on your care business. So I'll take you very briefly through the background. And then we'll turn to Paul to take you through the Supreme Court decision and the practical implications. Can I have the next slide, please, Gemma? So the what, what they've become known as the main cap cases, but really um, these the case arose out of two cases, the names of which are on the slide: um, Royal Main Cap against Thomas and Blake and Shannon against Rampersand and another. They actually began in the Employment Tribunal and they relate to the national minimum wage regulations. They progressed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and then they were heard together at the Court of Appeal and following the Court of Appeal decision they ended up at the Supreme Court and that's the decision we're going to be talking about a bit later. Can I have the next slide please? So just very briefly um, to set the, the background, in MENCAP it involved Mrs Tomlinson Blake, she was a care support worker or is a care support worker permitted to sleep during her shifts, she slept at the home of two vulnerable adults um, she had no duties to perform except to keep a listening ear and I had to attend any emergency and in the 16 months leading up to the employment hearing, the employment tribunal hearing, she was disturbed six times in that period of 16 months. Can I have the next slide please? And Sh the Shannon case that was involved Mr Shannon, he was an on-call night care assistant, was provided with free accommodation at uh, a care home. His a condition of his employment was that he had to be at that accommodation from 10 p.m. till 7 a.m. He was permitted to sleep during that period and the night care worker on duty could call him for assistance during that period. Can I have the next slide, please? So at the Employment Tribunal and then the Employment Appeal Tribunal, in MENCAP, the Employment Tribunal found in favour of Tomlinson Blake and determined that during the sleep-in shift, she was performing time work, and we'll come on to that because that's an important definition, whether she was awake or not. The Employment Appeal Tribunal found in favour of Thomas and Blake as well and determined that she was working throughout the entire shift as she was constantly on call. Now, on the other hand, in Mr Shannon's case, at the Employment Tribunal, the claim failed because his accommodation constituted his home and his claim also failed at the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Can I have the next slide, please? So 
They progressed onto the Court of Appeal and it's important to remember what was being focused on were the national minimum wage regulations and the definitions underneath them. So key definitions were what is time work and that's set out um, as work in respect of which a worker is entitled under their contract to be paid by reference to time or output. Regulation in 15 32. Time work also includes hours when a worker is available and required to be available. The employee needs to be awake for the purposes of working. And the next regulation that sets out you're not available for work when you're sleeping if the facilities are provided. Now that looked like an exception for sleep-ins. Can I have the next slide please? So what is interesting and it comes out through the the, the judgment which uh, the Supreme Court judgment but the at the employment tribunal stage and the employment appeal tribunal stage neither of those tribunals looked at the reports of the low pay commission so when the cases came on to be heard by the court of appeal the court of appeal did look at that and they held that the report of the low pay commission which in itself had led to the enactment of the national minimum wage act was significant now that report had recommended that the only time that should count for national minimum wage purposes were periods when workers on a sleep-in shift were awake and required to be available for work. And it appeared that the intention of that was to exempt sleep-in arrangements. Can I have the next slide, please? Now at the Court of Appeal, the cases, as I say, were heard together. The Court of Appeal heard in relation to MENCAP that the Employment Appeal Tribunal had been wrong in, the, in that case, as it was not enough that Tom Linton Blake had to have a listening ear to conclude that she was working throughout her night shift. In Shannon, they decided that case had been rightly decided by the tribunals, because either the fact that the accommodation was his home was an exemption which applied, or he was not working except on those occasions when he was called to assist during the night. Can I have the next slide, please? So from the appeal, Court of Appeal, we ended up where we are today at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court looked carefully at everything and looked at the interpretation of the national minimum wage regulations. And they found that a case which had been relied on by the Court of Appeal, which is the case of British Nursing Association against the Inland Revenue, should no longer be considered as authoritative. And that's important. And that's because the Court of Appeal, they found, had failed to understand the distinction between actual working time and being available for work and that could mean that in that case someone was to be paid the national minimum wage when actually they were asleep and the expectation was that they would be asleep. Can I have the next slide please? So what's the outcome and how does it affect you? Well I mean the bottom line is from the Supreme, Supreme Court decision is that a sleeping worker can't actually be working for national minimum wage purposes if the arrangement is that he's to be present and sleep on the premises during his hours of work subject only to emergency calls. What is necessary is to look at the arrangements that you have between employer and the worker to see what the worker is actually required to do when he's not asleep, but within the hours of the sleeping shift. But the way the regulations are to be interpreted is that only time woken to respond is captured by the national minimum wage and, and has to be paid. Otherwise, sleeping shifts do not attract payment of the national minimum wage. Can I have the next slide, please? And yes, so the court unanimously dismissed the appeals. The time that a worker is required to sleep on site does not count towards national minimum wage calculations. But where does that leave you as providers? Now, as I said, we've had a lot of, well, we've had quite a few inquiries um, in relation to sort of discrete issues around this. A number of providers, and I expect a number of you on the call, uh, on the webinar, will have been keeping an eye on this decision. Some providers may have already made changes to employees' contracts. Um, you know, to, to keep in line with national minimum wage, perhaps um, in contemplation that the court, uh, the Supreme Court decision might have been different. So where does that leave you now? Can you change contracts? What about local authorities? Are they going to change the amount that they pay for, for sleep-ins? Do you have to talk about a sleep-in allowance? And I'm going to pass you over to Paul to take you through some of these questions and some of his other um, observations about the practicalities of the Supreme Court decision. And as I say, at the end, there'll be an opportunity to take questions. So if you do have questions, pop them in the question and answer function and I'll pop them to Paul at the end of the session. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all on this bright, sunny morning. 
Well, we've been waiting four years for this. It seems amazing. And when you read the judgment of the Supreme Court, and I commend it to you, um, it's on a link at the end of these slides, particularly the judgment of Lady Arden, Lady Mary Arden, because it's very clear and very simple. You'd think there was no issue in it. But what I want to do is try and boil it down for you so that you can simply understand the decision and understand what you may have to consider when you make any changes you want to make, if you make changes. So let's see the next slide, please. So the, the, the question, when a worker is paid to attend the workplace to sleep, but to be available to be called to work in need, is that worker entitled to be paid at the rate of at least the national minimum wage? That's the simple question that was posed. And the answer is no. Um, and that is a final answer. There's no further appeals from this. There's no visits to Europe. The answer is no. So if the first, if you've got the question that is posed first, you, then the answer is clear. The employer and the worker are free to agree any fee or no fee, their agreement is not constrained by national minimum wage. Let's move on. Now it's important reading the, the judgment. This is not really about sleeping. It's about being required to be on site, but not required to be available for work. So it requires to any time of required attendance at work um, when you're not required to work until called. So at any time of that work, must be paid at any time called to work, the time must be paid at the national minimum wage rate for the time being. So that's important. So let's just look at the next slide. The, the worker must be both awake and awake for the purposes of work and not simply awake for his own purposes. So if the worker chooses an activity other than work uh, and, uh, until called to work, the national minimum wage applies. I apologize for the queue inserted by error. So national minimum wage does not apply. This might arise in the case of socializing, academic study, watching the television, a whole variety of other things. It's not particularly restricted to sleep. You're required, the worker is required to be on site, but is not required to be working until called for work. And that's quite important because it might be interesting for employment of students, um, others or people. There's no sort of police there's no sort of work police working saying, oh, well, now you're awake and watching the television. Um, you've got to pay the national minimum wage. That's not the case. This is an exception from the national minimum wage regulations. Next slide, please. Now, these are the contracts. The contract needs to set out the basic salary and the expected hours of work. But it should also set out um, rates for the time worked. And, and these will usually and should be hourly rates because then when the worker works, as it were, in an overtime situation or works for when called to work at night, then the hourly rate can be compared easily with the national minimum wage rate. Um, keep good records. Both the worker and the employer need to keep very clear records. And we would recommend that you know, when workers are called to work, a timesheet is completed for the start and the completion of that work. Because there may well be niggly little disputes about when people started, when they finished, but it's that period of work that's payable at at least national minimum wage. The rest of it is payable on whatever the rate or fee is, is payable for that non-work attendance. So let, next slide, please continue to monitor earning in the reference period to check on whether the national minimum wage compliance is much less important after the NCAP case. But still, where, where workers are paid at or close to the minimum wage, or maybe if there's an issue that they may be paid less, um, you need to make sure over the reference period, usually 13 weeks, that it's the average of earnings over that period. So where people are paid extra hours at extra rates, that can be balanced off against the lower rates. Um, there should be a separate provision for sleeping periods or other non-working attendance. So I've said, keep the records. 
ensure that the contract is clear. It can be a memorandum or it can be a side letter. It doesn't need to be written into a fancy lawyer contract. It, this, the side fees could be just in a letter or in a basic memorandum. But we would recommend that those be worker by worker. Ensure that there is a provision for each of them. Do not rely on service, custom and practice. The words we would have agreed or our practices are always going to be a, a bit of a recipe for disaster. So try and have a simple record. You have the worker's wage, the worker's hourly rate, and whether it's in a separate letter or whatever, an indication of what, if anything, and actually, although it probably won't arise, there's no reason why somebody shouldn't be, should be paid anything for one of these sleep-in periods. It's entirely up to the two parties to agree. And the next slide, please. So we, what we might see, we agree to pay so much money for whatever, e.g. attending Sunnyside Care Home to sleep and not to work, but to be called to work if required, and so as to be fit for work. The important issue here is that um, workers who are in this position must remember that if they are called to work, they must be up and alert and ready. They mustn't be otherwise distracted. They shouldn't be recovering from hangovers or anything like that. They are being paid to be fit to be work. Now, will you be paid twice? Will you pay twice? Well, maybe, because as they're two separate arrangements, if you're paid a flat fee for a sleep-in period, and then you get up and work, and you may very well be paid again for the hours actually worked at national minimum wage. And unless your arrangement has a provision to deduct the national minimum wage or the hourly rate payments from the fee, you will be um, paying effectively twice for the same thing. But you may not mind that because having somebody available may be something that is really useful for your service, particularly in the sort of service that Mrs. Tomlinson Brake was involved with where there were learning disabled adults who were prone to get up and wander in the night from time to time, very occasionally. And so it may be worth the employer's while to have that slight duplicate payment and worth the employee's while to think, well, I'm going to get paid when I work and I've got this extra payment to make sure I'm available on site. Um, now, next slide, please. Check and amend your employment, employment contracts. The Supreme Court ruling needs to be written into the contracts and there needs to be clarity. This is an opportunity to get it correct. Um, you cannot just say, ah, the Supreme Court ruled this, it's all back to square one. And many, many of you will have changed your contracts to provide for full national minimum wage payments during the night. Now you cannot um, just say to your workers, oh, well, it's all back to square one. Um, you're not going to get those payments anymore unless they agree. You cannot just change your contracts of employment unilaterally. No contract can be changed unless there's an agreement on both sides. Um, so it's really important that you address that issue and decide what you want to do. It's the opportunity to get this correct now, but it must be done. You cannot just assume it. And it may be unwelcome. It may not be unwelcome. So let's see the next slide. So this is your question. What if I have changed working terms to avoid national minimum wage problems? Can I just switch back? As I've said, no, your contracts of employment are binding. If you wish to change back, you will need to consult, negotiate and agree. Without agreement, matters do not just change. Check for any guaranteed hours of work, written or implied by a course of dealings. Sometimes there is an agreement for a minimum number of hours. In imposing adverse changes, could amount to a constructive dismissal. However, just to conclude on this, before all this happened, I heard of many, many workers who were really upset at losing the opportunity for a sleep-in fee because it was seen as a useful boost to working. Now, the, and the other thing you need to tie in with is whether your contracts actually um, provide for opt-outs from the working time regulations, but that's beyond the scope of this of this webinar, but many people liked to be paid being really being called very, very rarely, um, in addition to having shifts. So you could in fact work a shift, sleep overnight, not expect to be work, woken, but occasionally woken, and then work another shift. 
So for people, perhaps for a short period of time, it could be very advantageous. So some people may very well like the opportunity and some employers may like the opportunity to go back by agreement to the sleeping weight. Next slide, please. Um, just to recap, if the national minimum wage applies, it must be paid and failure to pay it can lead to serious uh, consequences. Enforcement, that is forcing the payment of the arrears, forcing the payment with interest, um, forcing, sorry, something. or you may be prosecuted and you may be prosecuted. Um, enforcement can order payments of all the arrears for up to six years. This is why there was so much concern about this particular case. Interest at whatever rate the court decides and the costs of enforcement. So um, you've got those two risks. It's really important. A lot was at stake in this case. National minimum wage must be paid if it applies. Get your contracts right. Separate out the sleeping from the contract. Next slide, please. And there, just to conclude, there's the link that we provided to the Supreme Court judgment. I think as Supreme Court judgment goes, it makes for quite um, relatively easy reading, and I would certainly recommend it. Thank you very much for being on this webinar. And now, I'm Laura and I are happy to take questions. Yeah, that would be great. We've got a few questions, just to remind people, if you want to put a question to us, um, we've got five or so minutes left. The question and answer function is just next to the chat function. Um, also, I noticed during Paul's presentation that we had a few additional participants join the webinar. So, um, apologies if there was some issues getting the links out. I think there were some last minute sign ups, but we will circulate a link to the video of the webinar and the slides so you'll be able to see what you've missed at the start. Um, well, one question that's come through is, um, and I, I don't know if we're able to answer that at this stage, but in relation to the Court of Appeal judgment and when local authority commissioners were thinking about what they'll pay providers for um, sleep-ins and they, I think some of them changed their sleep-in rate to an hourly rate. One question that's come back is, do, do we think that local authorities will adjust this or even, even try and claw back some of that funding from providers? Uh, well, once again, it's a matter of contract. Neither party, whether it's a local authority or whether it's you or whether it's a worker, can change a contract just unilaterally. It's extremely unlikely that any of these contracts, either with workers or with local authorities, profane provide provisions that in the circumstances that the Supreme Court um, cha doesn't, changes or doesn't change the situation, the matter reverts to where it was before. So if local authorities want to change what they pay at the moment, they've got to enter into a proper process to uh, consult and to negotiate. And if you don't like it, you don't have to agree. And if, if the local authority wants to change it, then they would have to enter into a process of terminating the agreement and offering new terms. But that will, will put the, the service users, many of whom are in this particular field, maybe physically or learning disabled, in considerable jeopardy. So I don't think people should be particularly aware of that but they should be aware of it on the other side, from the local authorities point of view, that when um, negotiations start or revised or increases in fees, and of course we are right at that particular moment in the year at the moment, you may find local authorities saying, well, you've all had a bit of a windfall from this, so um, um, you are, we, are, we, we are going to take that into account. But of course, you'll still be paying your workers what you're contractually agreed to pay until you change. And, then, and until you have changed, there's no reason for the local authorities exposure to be changed at all. So I don't think we should worry about that as much as some appear to be suggesting. Okay, so that's um, one question. Another question that's come through is, um, if providers opt to continue payments to reflect the national minimum wage, do providers need to amend employee contracts? Now, I assume that means that the contracts have been changed in the first place to make provision for national minimum wage pages, payments, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, and broadly speaking, no, because you've mm -hmm. changed your contracts to provide for that. If you're just going to carry with the same contract at the same rate, there's nothing to change. 
Yeah, and that's the, the person asking the questions confirmed that the contracts have been changed. So yeah, I mean, it's I think, is it back to what you were saying that it's a matter between you and the employee um, to, to agree exactly. the terms and to have those in the contract? Yeah, and of course, employees will be, some employees may be mm. rightfully concerned that their new established income might be reduced so that they may be concerned about that. Um, as some may welcome the return of the fixed fee sweeping. Mm. Uh, it's a matter for discussion and consultation. But no, if you're paying national minimum wage for people to be either asleep or awake, doesn't matter. That's what you've contractually agreed to pay. And until you've changed it, you must continue to pay. Yeah, so no change um, to existing contracts. And I guess providers might be thinking about whether they have to revisit new contracts for people that are um, new employees. I suppose that's a little bit easier in the sense that um, it is a new agreement for employees to new employees to accept or not, as the case may be, rather than having to make changes to historic employment contracts. Yeah, and of course, Laura, it's a marketplace. Um, so um, con em employees yeah. and employers will be in a marketplace discussing sometimes with the with assistance of trade unions, sometimes on their own, and, and the local market, the supply of labour, the willingness to accept certain terms will all come into play. And some, some employers may be um, in a competitive situation where they need to attract workers of the right skill, and they may be prepared to pay slightly differently and then try and reflect it in their onward contracts. Those who are dealing with local authorities will have the usual difficulty, but um, there have been some inroads in that in, in recent years. Okay, I'm just checking. There's a few more questions in the Q and A, but they seem to be similar, just about making changes to contracts that were changed as part of the, uh, but before the Supreme Court decision. So you've covered that in terms of. Um, I think it would be before the Court of Appeal decision, that you order, because yeah. it was the Employment Appeal. Sorry, tribunal. yes, yes, yes. Apologies. The Employment Appeal Tribunal decision, which is now a long, long time ago, so people will have got used to this. Yeah. Um, so I think all the other questions relate to that, unless um, if there's anyone else that has any questions, um, this is your opportunity. Otherwise, if I could just, oh. oh, yeah, no, just a comment that the judgment has been a long time coming and it's good that we have a decision and that providers can move forward. I think that's right. And I think that's generally the feeling of the sector. I mean, of course, there are longstanding issues about funding of the care sector generally and how, um, you know, providers have the funding um, in terms of setting wages, etc. But this this decision relates purely to interpretation of the national minimum wage regulations. And I think the prospect of having this judgment hanging over the care providers or the care sector's head for such a long time, with the potential for such um, a large back pay liability had the decision gone the other way, was quite an unsettling time. So I, I do agree that. Um, that it has it has been a long time coming and it's good that we have clarity from providers just one quick last question that's come through is how do we think local authorities are likely to respond it's a little bit like watch this watch this space we're not sure but that is something that um what well, impulse covered it to an extent in, in the last question that you dealt with but it is a little bit of wait and see we're waiting to see something centrally from local authorities um oh have we got one more question we've just about got enough time So I think it, well, maybe actually this might cover off. Paul, can I just ask this last question to you? We've got a provider who is concerned that if their employees don't agree to allow them to change from a national minimum wage agreement to a flat rate, where does that leave them as, a, as an employer? Because the local authority will only pay a flat rate. So the provider would be continually out of pocket. Um, how, how can providers best deal with that? I think um, that would be a very difficult situation. But, um, mm. First of all, as I've said a couple of times, you cannot force the employees to change. Um, the only way in which you could change that after a consultation would be to go through a process of dismissing the employers and employees and employing them on new terms. But that's fraught with difficulty and yeah. you should take very careful advice before taking that sort of step and would certainly be resisted by trade unions. But I don't think we should be too gloomy about local authorities. Local authorities cannot just change their, I mean, if at the moment they're only paying enough to cover a flat rate, then that contract will hold. But if they're paying a higher rate, 
I see no justification for them changing um, back just because of this. And the, the, maybe they don't increase as much as they would have done otherwise, because this is a counterbalance to the relatively low rates of inflation and wage rates that are going on. But I think it's also a question of being firm, particularly with you are physical or learning disability service providers, because these, these um, services are the, are the homes of the individuals who are there. They're there for basically the whole of their lives. For the local authority to take steps that would put them in jeopardy would place the local authority in serious risk, not only a breach of contract, but of um, all kinds of claims, particularly under the Human Rights Act, from those representing the, the um, service users at their service level being put in jeopardy by the local authority artificially trying to reduce, particularly if there's no balancing reduction in the cost. So um, be of good cheer, as they say, and, and stand up to them. Um, and don't accept any letters that say, well, now the Supreme Court has confirmed this, we're going to make this as an excuse to reduce all our, all our weekly rates. No, it shouldn't happen. That's helpful. I think that covers off the, the gist of a, a lot of the questions that have popped through. So if I could just have the next slide, Gemma. Um, I hope everyone's found um, found the webinar useful today. As I say, this was a sort of extra um, extra webinar from our usual programme, just in response to developments in the sector. We are, while we await um, the return of live events with bated breath, still continuing to run a few more webinars throughout the year. We will be having one in May. Um, topics are still very much under discussion. There are some new CQC developments that I'm sure providers will be interested in, but if there is anything that you want us to discuss, then by all means get in touch. Um, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter for updates, um, and you can contact us through the website as well. And um, can I just have the next slide? And that will just give you all the details that you need to, to get in touch with us. As I say, for those that joined late, welcome. You will get the video, um, you will get the slides as will everybody. I hope you found today useful. And if you do have any sort of specific questions, then don't hesitate to get in touch. But that brings the webinar to an end today. So thank you very much for attending. And we hope to see you on another webinar or or even a live event, not not too not too far away. So take care everyone and enjoy the sunshine and the slight easing of lockdown. Thanks.